We are live. We got one person joining us today. Mr. Kelly. Hi. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> um, okay, so I really apologize. I did not get that up yesterday. I thought I did. Uh, things long and um, so anyhow, uh, a quick recap. Um, we're going to be talking about Warren G. Harding. Those three presidents of black and, black and white, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, they're all Republicans. They're going to be the next three presidents we talk about. Woodrow Wilson, AW. Woodrow Wilson was the president during World War I. Okay. So the next election will be 1920. And by the way, so it'll be the first election that ladies, you get to vote in. Okay. So uh, when we talked about, so we'll get to Harding quite a bit more than you'll like, probably. We talked about World War One, and I kind of wrapped it up. So there's some really interesting statistics if you missed the video yesterday on World War One and just how brutal it was. And really, what I was trying to do was give you the mindset of not just the American people, but people around the world, especially in Europe, uh, of the horrors of World War One, and people were really reluctant to do it again when the time came. Okay, which is gonna have a lot of consequences, okay? So that's that's really important to what we're going to be studying over the next six weeks is the after effects of World War One. okay? Um, then uh, we talked about Russia pulling out, okay? They're led by Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. I talked about how Bolshevik means the majority. The majority is the working man rising up against the aristocracy, the rich, the wealthy, the owners of businesses, the managers, and so forth, okay? So uh, communism in and of itself, obviously, uh, its ideology uh, created by Karl Marx. He had a, he had a, a co-author. Does anybody know the co-author's name with uh, Karl Marx on the manifesto? His name was Fred, Frederick or Friedrich Engels. Okay. And Marx was a German Jew, and he was living in London during uh, the industrial age in London. Is that me? No, that's Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, hit your mute button. <laughs> okay. uh, you're, feel free to chime in if you want. But <laughs> I did, I had a really good question second hour from the, from the live stream and it got us off track for about 10 minutes, but it was a good question. Um, anyhow, um, so what we have here is with communism, guys, and I please watch the video because I really drive this home on um, what that means. And basically, it means no religion, it means no private property, and the fact that communism has been tried many times in the 20th century, okay, it has never worked. Okay, and so after Lenin, you're going to get Joseph Stalin, okay, and basically, we know it doesn't work because they become dictatorships. Uh, not where everyone is equal. I mean, that's what uh, communism is about, is the equalization, where everyone, to everyone, their need, and everyone shares, okay? And so um, we know the names, Stalin, Mao, Zedong, uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, the Castros, okay? We, they've all become dictators, all right? Now, so we were opposed to communism in this country. Okay, we believe in the ideas of freedom and capitalism in the free market. And so the ideas here we are opposed to, we are actually going to try and help the czar. Okay, the czar is the leader that's being overthrown, right? The czar Nicholas and his family, his daughter, you know the story, right? You've seen the cartoon, all right? So one of the things I said yesterday was when I say red, you say what? Communism. Communism, okay? So the red army versus the white army, it's the white army of the czar, okay? The United States and Britain and some of the other allies are actually going to try and help the white army against the red army, okay? Now, we're not going to use our soldiers with, you know, guns to do that. We're going to try and supply them. We're going to try and supply them with um, weapons or food or other logistics, okay? So we are gonna bolster the resistance to the communists helping the whites, okay? 
This is going to prolong the civil war or the revolution in Russia. Okay, so right there, guys, this feeds a distrust of the West. Okay, this is a term that's used a lot is the West. What is meant by the West? North America and South America. Okay, it could be the Western Hemisphere, but it's also Western Europe. Okay, so guys, back long when I first started teaching here for a few years, they used to have a class you would take. It's called history. It was a history class you would take your sophomore year. What history class did you take your sophomore year? History. World history. It used to have another name. Anybody know what that name is? Western civilization. Western civ. I took it in college. I took it in high school. Okay. It's, it's world history from whose point of view? From the Western point of view. Now, that also almost goes hand in hand with the history of Christianity. Okay. Because what settled the Western Hemisphere? Christianity did. Started with the Spanish, right? Catholics. Okay. And then by the 1620, you get the Protestants showing up here. Okay. In, in, Port, in Plymouth Rock, right? You get the, the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Okay. And so, guys, uh, Western civilization extended from Western Europe into the New World. And we view the world in different ways than, say, the Chinese do. Or the Japanese do, or the Russians do. Okay, we have our own view of what society is, and a lot of that is backed in Judeo-Christian thought. Okay, so it's ethnocentric. I don't know if you know that word. Viewing the world through your own ethnic history. Yes. Okay. So Western civilization is ethnocentric, where world history. You try and see history through the world, the eyes of others. Okay, it's more of a multicultural type of situation. If that makes sense. Okay, but in the context of what we're talking about here, where basically this huge country called this, what will become known as the Soviet Union, over there in pink. Okay, on the map. I drug this out of the closet. Come on. Okay. This is the Soviet Union. Okay. And it would be from 1970 until 1990. Okay. This transforms the planet. I mean, this creates a whole, whole new thing. Okay. Now, it's interesting that communism took root in Russia first. I mean, everybody. Not everybody, but scholars all over the world had read Marx's Communist Manifesto. Okay, most people knew about it, right this idea of equality to the common man, and um, so when it happened, most people thought it would take root somewhere in the industrialized world first, because when Marx wrote this in London. He was seeing all the factories. That I think we talked about this before, where you had very unsatisfactory working conditions, people living in horrible conditions. The air was bad. There was social unrest. Okay, that's where you think communism is going to take root. You understand? Okay, so when it happened in Russia, people were shocked by that because Russia had not industrialized like Europe had yet. Okay, so it's quite interesting. And it's going to impact their economy in a very bad way. Okay. Because of collectivism. And I talked about this yesterday in the video about farming practices. Rather than you being able to work on your own land and make a profit, you now shared that with other people. So the profit motive starts to disappear because the government's going to take what it wants or what it thinks it needs. Okay? And you're not in control of your own destiny. And it leads to, leads to massive starvation in Russia. Massive. Millions of people are going to starve to death because of a planned economy. Okay? We don't use that. Well, we should. 
Okay, and for most of our country, we didn't use a planned economy. The economy was driven by the consumer. Okay, what you want, what you need. These things revolutionized our lives. Yes. Now they make them a lot simpler. I I graded seventy percent of the homework you guys turned in for the 9-11 video on this, okay? My calendar's on here, my alarm's on here, this is my watch, right? Okay, it revolution, there's demand for that and it's being filled, okay? Now, that created a huge amount of wealth in this country. Okay, think about all the people that sell these and use them to be more efficient at their business. This has helped create wealth for other people, not just Apple. Okay, now the people that work in the sweatshops in China that build these things, I'm not sure if they're making, you know, a lot of wealth for those people, if you know what I mean. Now, it may be better than what they had before as far as having a job. Now, if, if they had better labor laws in China that took care of people, which you would think they'd have in a communist country like China, like very good labor laws that would protect the worker, right? No, they don't, okay? They allow these sweatshops. I mean, Walmart got in big trouble a few years ago because the clothing that they were selling at Walmart was being made by children. Okay, so what is said in the way of communism isn't always true in the name of communism, okay? So we start to fear this ideology back in the United States. Why would we fear this? Well, what's the American dream? Okay, we talk about the American dream, okay? But for most people in the United States, what is the American dream? To achieve the American dream. And by the way, I feel like I have. What would you put on a list of things to achieve the American dream? Anybody? Yeah. Of like um, stable income and to like have a family. Okay. Good. You know, a, a, a job where you can support a family. Okay. How about home ownership? Owning your own property. Owning your own home. I think that's a big part of the American dream, okay? That's this little slice of heaven that's yours. And you can fix it up however you want and do whatever you want inside your own home and nobody's gonna get in your way of happiness, okay? And, and having enough money to do that, okay? To, to achieve your own happiness, to pursue your own happiness. Yeah? Is there a lot of private property? Like how do people know there's not you, you don't have private property. So like they just like live wherever they live and they were told where to work and where to live. Especially if you like you owned a plot of land. Okay. They said, okay, from here on out, these people are gonna help you take care of it. Okay. And then you don't get to keep what's left over. The government I mean you might be able to feed your family with it, and then whatever's left over, the government's gonna take or distribute to other people, or just take for itself. So the profit motive is huge in capitalism, okay? Um, right now, pharmaceutical companies all over the world are trying to make a vaccine, yes? Okay, let's say you come out with a very good vaccine and your company's called Pfizer. Now, how much money are they investing right now into the research? They're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars. So Pfizer charges you a lot for prescription drugs, so they have money to do this research and development, okay? And then when they get the vaccine, how many doses are they gonna be able to sell? Hundreds of millions. And they're gonna make lots of money. There's a profit motive, okay? If the government owns the pharmaceutical company, okay, and there's no profit motive, are you going to see people in there busting their butt for 60, 80 hours a week trying to find this vaccine? Why would you go become a doctor and go to school for 12 years if you knew you could only make $50,000 a year? You 
because if you become a doctor, depending on what kind of doctor you are, you can make a lot of money, can you not? You can also help people. Now, one of the reasons people want to become doctors is to help people, right? It's not the only reason. It's the extrinsic value of money and the American dream, okay? It's a combination. But if there's no reason to get ahead, it's just like your grade in this class. We talk about communism. This is the lowest common denominator. Let's talk about that, okay? Grace, you get an A on the first test, okay? Lexi, you get a C. I'm sorry. It happens from time to time. Okay, but it's not really fair, is it? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take away some of Grace's grade, and we're going to give it to you, and you're going to have a B. And so is she. Okay, now, on the next test, because Grace studied for like three hours for this test. Okay, you studied for two hours. you got a C. Okay, now Grace, next time she's going, you know, I studied for three hours, and I got a B when I had an A. So next time, Grace is just going to study for an hour. Okay? And she's going to make a B. And you're like, you know what? If I don't study, the government's going to help me anyways. So I'm not going to study at all. And you're going to make a D. Because you're paying attention to class. So you're going to at least pass. You're going to get a D. <laughs> but now, this, that's not fair. We're going to take your B. You're going to give part to her. You're going to get a C. And you're going to get a C. Now you both have C's. Okay? What happens on the next test? There's no profit motive. There's no reason to work hard. Okay? It, in our welfare system today, guys, in some states, it's more profitable to be on welfare than to, to go work minimum wage or not even minimum wage. Work for $10 an hour for 40, day, four hour, 40 hours a week. It's In some states like uh, Hawaii, it's more profitable to just be on welfare. Okay? So... That can lead to downfall of society, downfall of your economy, which is eventually what happened to the Soviet Union. Now, as I was saying in the lecture yesterday, Vietnam and China, they are communist nations, but they don't have communist economies. They have private property. And I'm not kidding when I say it's probably easier to open a business in China than it is in California. There are so many rules and regulations you have to abide by in California to open a business. It makes it very difficult. Okay, China's not stupid. They know they can't keep up with the United States using communist economic principles. It's silly. And yet here we are. Many of us are choosing to think that that's the way to go. Let's look at history. Okay, what works? Capitalism works. Capitalism has brought more people out of poverty than any other economic system in the history of the world. Okay, communism doesn't pe bring people out of poverty. Okay, look it up. I mean, don't take my word for it. Okay. All right, so we start to fear communism at home. Okay, so moving to the second slide. Okay, not as many pictures, but I do have a couple. Okay, so. After a war, guys, when we mobilize for war, we build all the shoes, the boots, the uniforms, the guns, the bullets, the tanks, the aircraft. We build all that stuff for the military, all the ships, okay? There's a fear that production is going to fall after the war's over, and we're going to go into, like, a recession or a depression, okay? So Congress is worried about that, and the workers are worried about that. And so labor unions, so when we say labor, we're talking about unions, okay? Labor unions start to encourage workers to go on strike. And in 1919, there were over 4 million workers on strike. There's about 100 million people in the country by 1919. Okay, we have 330 million now. So about 100 million people in the country. 4 million. We're talking dock workers. We're talking factory workers. Uh, railroad, coal miners, these people are going on strike, okay? $2 billion in lost sales and wages, and then there's violence that is accompanied by this, okay? Now, I have some friends on Facebook that like to talk about what's going on currently in our country, and they do have a point to an extent, okay, about violence and protest, okay? So, 
peaceful protest, everybody agrees, is completely fine. Actually, it's good. Okay, it's something that we have a long tradition of in this country, okay, of peaceful protests. We also have a history of violent protests, okay, and sometimes people feel like you have to get violent to get your message across, okay. When that harms other people's livelihood, like their businesses, their homes, their property, then you're negatively impacting other people for your cause, okay. That's something to remember, all right. But when it comes to union violence, it's it's kind of like this. So let's say recording this and making it public, but <laughs> oh, let's say and I'm going to whisper here. Let's say the Bishop Carroll teachers decide to form a union, so we don't have a union, okay? And it's going to be Mrs. Fox, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Barber. Okay, and myself, we're going to be the secret union leaders. We're going to go around and talk to all the teachers and say, look, this is crazy. Okay. We're not making as much as the public schools and so forth. we got all this extra work. Okay. We, want, we want a 6% pay raise. Okay. So we form this union quietly. Now, we do it quietly because a lot of businesses don't want you to form a union. Okay. Um, so they might find a reason to fire the three of us before we can actually pull this off. You know, that's why we're keeping this on the down low, right? So we form this union, okay? And we get all the teachers and we go to the diocese and say, look, we have formed a union and if we don't get a 6% pay raise, we're going to go on strike. And they call our bluff and they say, okay, fine. You're not getting 6%. We don't have the money. Sorry. Okay. So we go on strike. So the first day of school, when you guys show up, you'll see us out on Central carrying signs. <laughs> Social justice for Catholic school teachers. Hell no, we won't go. <laughs> now you take a teacher like uh, Mr. Shelling, Mr. Mains, okay? These are new fathers. They have families. They have mortgages, okay? And so that first paycheck you miss I mean, that might have been your car payment, you know what I mean? That might have been groceries for the family. So that second payment you miss, that might be your mortgage, okay? Well, let's say I was one of those people. I use myself as an example. And I'm like, I really need to go back to work. I'm going to break the strike, okay? I'm going to sneak into the building and teach and get paid, okay? Now, what do you call somebody that breaks a strike? There's a kind of a nasty name for strike breakers. Anybody know this one? Call them a scab. Okay, that's a pleasant thing to call somebody a scab. Okay, so I become a scab. So you know what I do is I park my truck down the baseball field like I'm working out there, right? I sneak up into the building, I teach, and while Barber's out there marching on Central all day, it's like, where's he right at? And somebody says, well, I think I saw his truck down there. So he goes down there. See, if I'm down there, I'm not anywhere to be seen. He knows what I'm doing. So when I come back out, my windshield's busted in. My tires are slashed because I am breaking the strike. I am making it harder for everybody else to, to succeed in this mission. You follow me? So sometimes you get union violence like that against people that, or they may hire new teachers to come in, and they get attacked by the strikers, you know what I mean? So union violence starts to break out. Four million people on strike, and it starts to scare people, okay? Now, what do unions do? What is the goal of a union? It's to help who? Right? To do what? To bargain against who? Okay. Does that, sh does that sound familiar to anything that we've been talking about in the recent day and a half? Yeah. The, like, Bolshevik. The Bolshevik? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the Bolshevik movement. Now, am I here to say that union leaders and union people are communists? No. But if you were to look for communists, would a union be a good place to find them? Possibly, okay? So there's this fear, okay?
Okay? So strikes are opposed by almost everybody. Businesses, they don't like these. The government doesn't like the instability, right? They don't like the violence. They don't like the chaos of it, okay? The courts will strike down some of these strikes as illegal, and the general public is frightened by it, okay? And then you get people saying that these unions and these union bosses are like communists, which we're already afraid of. We fear that, okay? Because you want to live the American dream. And part of that American dream is private property ownership. And maybe being able to be married in a church. And take your family to church every Sunday. Or Saturday night. Okay. Maybe that's part of your dream. But under communism, that's not allowed. Then, in Boston, the police go on strike. Imagine a world without police. Oh, wait a second. There are actually people trying to do that. Wouldn't it be awesome if the Wichita Police Department went on strike? You could do whatever you want. You could drive as fast as you want. You could assault people and not get arrested. It's like The Purge. You guys seen that movie? How many of you guys seen The Purge? It's crazy, okay? So the governor of Massachusetts is a guy named Calvin Coolidge. Yeah, it's that guy in the middle back there, okay? Calvin Coolidge is the governor of Massachusetts. He calls in the National Guard, saves Boston from the chaos, okay? It's exactly what President Trump's been saying to the mayor of Portland, Oregon, where they've had riots there for 100 days straight. Hey. Give me a call. I'll send in the National Guard and we'll stop it. Just like they did in Kenosha. Okay? He becomes kind of a well-known figure, Coolidge. And Harding, who's running for president, says, Hey, Calvin, you want to be my running mate and run for vice president? Coolidge says yes. So they will be elected in 1940. Okay? Harding, Coolidge. And then Harding's going to die later on. Coolidge will become president. Okay. President Wilson, 1919, he's still president, and the courts will turn back the coal strikes. And because of all this bad media, the unions' membership will decline. Okay. Fewer people will want to be associated with the union. Okay. Now, I don't want to give the impression that I'm anti union here. Okay. So let me just say that unions, and you guys learned about this last year, like the Triangle Shirt Company, right? Is that what it was called? Uh, the one in, in New York. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the factory there where all the women were working and the working conditions were really harsh. And then they didn't have, you know, safety precautions for fire and a bunch of people died, right? Yeah, yeah. They locked them in. And, um, there's another one that, that, uh, that a lot of people talk about. In history lately, and that was the one with the uh, what's the stuff you put in uh, can, can, uh, cadmium or something like radium? Radium. Yeah, it goes in. Poison. Does it go in watches? Yeah, it's yeah. Blowing it yeah, 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 yeah. Same thing, right? Uh, so you in child labor, right? So unions have done a lot for the American world. Okay, so I. I don't, they don't make tape like they used to. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I just bought a new roll of this stuff, and it just is not very good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't mean to sound anti-union here, um, but I'm talking about the perceptions of people, yes? Okay, in this fear. Now, things are going to go from bad. To worse, all right. And I'm going to do a little bit more on unions tomorrow. Okay. So here's the Boston police on strike with the funny hats. Okay. Are they going on strike tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Better pay. Okay. We're good, guys. This 1919 is a crazy year. It's like 2020. All 
right? It's a crazy year, right? 1919 is a crazy year, okay? So is 1968. Okay, you want to look back at chaotic years in American history, 1919, 1775, <laughs> 2020, 1968, okay? Uh, so urban riots. Now, these are race riots, okay? Um, Lynching of black Americans, okay? Uh, lynching, you guys know that what that means. It means hanging somebody illegally, okay? It's a term that uh, goes back to the Civil War. There was a, a Southern colonel that uh, would hang uh, deserters and runaway slaves, uh, and his name was Lynch. That's where the term comes from, okay? Uh, race riots. Now, 25 major cities around the United States, there's race riots, okay? Now, guys, this is not what you're thinking. When we say a race riot, do you guys remember, ever remember hearing about the Rodney King case in Los Angeles? This is back in the 1990s, okay? Rodney King was uh, high on PCP, okay? And... The police tried to detain him, and he fought back. And, guys, when you're on PCP or angel dust, when you have, like, superhuman strength, you know what I mean? You don't feel pain. You, you're, you know. So there's a somebody took a video, and the cops are absolutely beating this man hard with fists, batons, feet. I mean, they... And so when Rodney King goes to the hospital, I mean, his face just mangled and swollen. And guys, the cops got, they didn't get charged because the guy was resisting, he was high on PCP, and when those guys didn't get charged or were found not guilty, okay, by a jury, riots in Los Angeles, okay? And it was a race riot. This is different. This is white people attacking black people in 1990, okay? This is where white people are seeking out black people and, and beating them up, destroying their property and so forth, okay? This is different, okay? And there's examples of this, not just in 1919. There was a big one in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, there was a, a large community in Tulsa where, forget the exact name of it, forgive me, please, um, where there was a very vibrant, middle-class, African-American part of Tulsa. And um, this is bad. I mean, white people went in there and killed and burned their community. Okay? So this is not what you would think by a, a typical race riot of, what we've seen in, oh, since the 1960s, okay? Um, so the attorney general at the time under Wilson is a guy named A. Mitchell Palmer, okay? Now, Palmer's going to play a very important role in American history here as we move into 1919 and the 1920s, okay? He's accusing these people, the unions that are violent, and the race riots are being stoked by communist agitators. Okay, so what we're going to see here is what's called a red, red, um, communist scare. Now, some of you might be familiar with the red scare of the 1950s with a guy named Joseph McCarthy. McCarthyism, you should learn that in English your sophomore year. When you read, what's the book you read? No. No. No, it was just, was it the ones with the Salem Witch Trial? Oh, that was oh, Scarlet. That was junior, oh. year. junior year. The Scarlet Letter? Scarlet Letter? No. No, no. The Crucible. The, Crucible. <laughs> the Witches, right? The Witches, yes. Okay, so um, that's, you kind of, uh, your English teacher will probably bring up McCarthyism during that book, okay? And, and I will be talking about that later on when we get to the 1950s, okay? Uh, but this is the first red scare. That was the second red scare, okay? And it, and it had 
a huge impact on this country. Okay, so let me read this. A dreadful wave of lynching and anti-Negro violence permeated the very fiber of the United States in 1919. Lynching was so pervasive that James Walden Johnson labeled it the Red Summer of 1919, this case for blood, okay? Uh, during the Red Summer, 76 blacks were reported to lynch 26 race riots. One of the worst took place in the nation's capital, almost in sight of the, of the White House, where six blacks were killed and 100 were wounded, okay? It goes from worse to dreadful. Now, I'm going to come back to this tomorrow on unions, okay? Don't let me forget. Because we got to talk about it. Now we got terrorism, guys. Bomb scare. Okay? Domestic terrorism. We've had a little bit of that in this country. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I believe the Department of Justice has labeled Antifa, or Antifa, however you want to say it, as a domestic terrorist organization. Okay? Which, if you are classified as a domestic terrorist organization, the penalties you can face for things like arson and so forth become federal crimes. Okay? Now, mail bombs. Okay? Did any of you guys ever hear about the Unabomber back in the 1980s? Remember the Ted Kaczynski? Okay. That's a story for another day. Okay? So, mail bombs are sent. Look at who's being sent these mail bombs. The Attorney General, who said, you know, anarchists and Bolsheviks, okay? Secretary of Labor, what does Secretary of Labor deal with? Labor what? Unions, okay? With workers and so forth. J.P. Morgan, what kind of business was J.P. Morgan in? Yeah, huge multinational banker, okay? And then, of course, Rockefeller was what? Oil, okay? Then a bomb goes off corner of Broad and Wall Street. This is the aftermath of that. Okay. Kills 38 people. Injures hundreds. Right here. What's at the corner of Broad and Wall Street? It's New York Stock Exchange. Now, you guys play detective here, okay? Put on your detective hat. Alright, you're trying to figure out who's sending these mail bombs. Who's killing these people? Who's doing this? Look at the targets. Would you call Morgan and Rockefeller capitalists? And would you say the New York Stock Exchange is one of the greatest symbols of capitalism there is? It's an attack on our system, our capitalist system. And what might be an opposite ideology to capitalism? Right? Who's doing this? Communists are. Okay, you got to think that, right? So Palmer, the Attorney General, he kind of freaks out on this. Now, you might freak out on this, too, if a bomb goes off on your front doorstep and blows out the facade of your house. You might become paranoid. So Palmer's going to act. He's going to act illegally. We have something in this country called due process, right? You have a right to be, uh, you can't be detained without being charged for more than 72 hours. You can't be convicted without a trial. You have the right to an attorney. We'll talk about bill rights in, the, in government, okay? So Palmer feels like the country's full of these anarchists and Bolsheviks. In fact, there may have been quite a few. Okay? Palmer starts arresting people and then deporting them, especially immigrants. Now, if you're from Russia and you're in this country and we have a fear of communism, and foreigners, things may not turn out too well for you. 
Now, because of all this fear that's going on, let me recap. Union violence, race riots, bombs. Guys, I have to report this to you, if you didn't already know, that the vast majority of this of people in this country during this time period, in the first, say, 150 years of this country, were wasps. Anybody know what a wasp is? You're looking at one. White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. It's a wasp. Okay? The majority of Americans were white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. So if there's chaos going on in the country, the movement becomes anybody that is different than me is a threat to me. Okay? So many American citizens started venting their fears towards anybody that was seen as different. Blacks, Jews, Catholics, and also most especially, immigrants. A fear of foreigners. Now you guys know these notes are online, right? Yeah. We're almost out of time, but this xenophobia, which is the term for fear of foreigners, I want to speak on quite a bit tomorrow, okay? And then I want to talk about unions, and then we'll move on with the Harding administration, because this goes from this to the KKK, okay, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. Good? Because there, there's a lot of interesting information with this, okay? Uh, things that we can learn from, you know, from our perspective today uh, and what happened here, okay? See you guys in person tomorrow, or uh, Thursday, Thursday, yes. Are you going to I, I'm not doing anything tomorrow. So you can, yeah. Yeah.